Silicon Valley innovations have delivered products and services that have changed the way we live and work. The question is, can these innovations now be harnessed to address the grand global challenges, including food, water, energy, and education? My name is Jim Connor. Welcome to Game Changers Silicon Valley. Tonight's show is about the activities that are taking place to address the grand global challenges and how those results can be delivered. My guests are Pascal Finette of Singularity University and Susan Lucas Conwell, an innovation analyst working with the Global 1000 companies. Susan and Pascal, welcome to the show. Pascal, let me start with you by giving us an overview of this concept of exponential thinking. Yeah, of course. Uh, first of all, super happy to be here, Jim. Um, so the idea of exponential thinking is that technology moves on an exponentially accelerating curve. Um, probably best known, Moore's Law. Moore's Law stipulates roughly that computers get twice as fast every two years. Now that's a compound growth. What this means for us is that we as humans are really not well equipped to understand exponential trends um, intuitively. So by training your mind to understand and fundamentally feel those exponential trends, you actually equip yourself to understand how the future will look like. Very simple example, imagine a computer. How good is a computer in 20 years? Now you can do probably the math, but even if you do the math right, how good does this actually mean? What does it mean for you as a, as a human being, like having all this compute power, for, for example? Mm -hmm. So this is a classic example of exponential thinking. Mm. Let me just uh, ask you a little more because uh, the computer that I used was to say 15 years ago, which have been around 2002, is uh, completely inadequate for today's application. Um, I could not at that time in, even in any way imagine the power that we see today. And so I cannot imagine in any way what 15 years of exponential thinking will produce. So how do you engage in this concept? I give you a simple example. So you take something like Siri or Google Now Cortana, these voice activated um, assistants. Um, Siri is about seven years old. Siri doubles in capacity roughly every year at the moment. So the question then becomes, if you know, if you look at Siri today and you extrapolate out how good is Siri in seven years, it's gonna be 128 times as good. And then the question, the big question becomes, what does that even mean, right? So then you break it down into its components and you say, Siri is today voice recognition, cognition, it understands what you're saying, what you mean, as well as a, se a set of services it connects to. I give you a simple example. I was uh, with a car a manufacturer. They showed me the dashboard of the future, right? Like the dashboard they're building into their cars in five to seven years. And it still had knobs. And I looked at them and I was like, you will talk to your car. You don't need knobs anymore, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't need a knob on my radio. I just go in and say, hey, I want to listen to, you know, this particular song, and the radio will react to it. Mm -hmm. So that's how you train yourself in exponential thinking. Okay. Susan, nice to see you again. I've known you for a number of years. You've been involved mm -hmm. with the uh, corporate innovation programs around the world, for that matter, and you're also involved with Singularity University. What kind of role are you playing in this concept of exponential thinking? So my role is um, two-sided. One is on behalf of those corporations like the car manufacturer or a company like a Siemens or a KLA 10 core or any Fortune or Global 1000 company, they can't innovate out of a paper bag. And so they need help connecting to the innovation ecosystem, to organizations like Sandhill Angels, like Singularity, like other accelerators or startup places to figure out how to connect to where that technology is gonna come from and to bring it inside without killing it. Mm -hmm. That's a big danger. That uh, the survival rate isn't very high. And I'm not talking about corporate development or m and I'm talking about how do we bring in from the outside innovation that we didn't create, but that is gonna move our corporation in new markets. Well, and okay. then I mentor some of the startups at Singularity and I've done that for several years and it's been a great pleasure because they look at the world and the impact that technologies will have on the world. Mm -hmm. So I read over the web pages of Singularity University and I, I know some of your work and so mm -hmm. my first question is about this, is you work with, or have seen many accelerators in mm -hmm. different uh, levels, whether they're uh, vertical, like uh, life science or something else. Are they doing something different at Singularity University than you've seen in other places? My impression, is that they are doing something that's profoundly different because they are not just looking at the next food service app 
or the next dry cleaning app. They're looking at what technology and what startups and what entrepreneurs, what brilliant minds are doing that will change the world and will impact millions and billions, not just you and I when we're at home in our very comfortable homes in Silicon Valley looking to order Indian food. And that's profoundly different. Well, we talked on the phone and you've got, I mean, frankly, I, when I looked at it, I said, when I looked, I said, food, water, clean time. I mean, these are enormous mm -hmm. projects and enormous undertakings. And you've got seven, six or seven of them mm -hmm. at the society level and six or seven at the environmental level, I believe. Uh, is there any attempt to kind of pick one or two per year or er, er, every year? Or are you going full bore on all of them? So what we did is we went through an exercise to identify um, what we call the global grand challenges. So what are the, the really big problems we as a society globally face um, for the future? Um, and it's very similar to an exercise the uh, United Nations did with what they call the, um, the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. Um, and we came up with a set of goals, which you uh, already outlined, and we believe we need to attack all of them, right? Um, it is not good enough to just solve, let's say, the food crisis when there's still 800 million people who don't have access to clean drinking water um, or there's children who can't read or write, right? Um, so what we inspire and aspire for is uh, to uh, work with entrepreneurs um, who are tackling the world's biggest problems. And we basically, we're pretty agnostic towards what the specific problem is an entrepreneur wants to tackle as long as it fits into the, this idea of solving the world's biggest problems. And, um, you know, uh, overall the world is moving in the right direction. I think we're, like, on a daily basis, the world, even if we don't feel it, um, does get better, but we clearly have our work cut out for us. So one thing that I at least read about is that you've got two or three levels of uh, expertise. And when mm -hmm. I say that, I don't mean deep. I, I mean, you've got the entrepreneurial group, the mm -hmm. singular Singularity University Labs mm -hmm. called SU Labs. You've got now the corporations who are I guess considering that maybe you can speak about their role and you've got this entity called partners as I understand it. Maybe you can explain how do those three entities work together? Yeah. So for us it's really important to understand that the best ideas and the best solutions come out of diversity. Diversity of thought, diversity of background and when you bring all the stakeholders at the table. So I, f I fundamentally believe like if you are only an entrepreneur, if you're only a corporate or if you're only an NGO or non-government organization, you probably will not solve the world's biggest problems. But when you bring those together and have them collaborate, co-create, then you have a shot at actually making a real difference. That's the reason why we love working with all types of groups, including, by the way, also governmental groups, um, because you really literally have to have everyone needs to be at the table to solve these mm -hmm. problems. Uh, I take it you're involved in some of these groups to so make yes. them work, and, and how does it actually take place? I mean, I, in my experience, you've got the on entrepreneurs who are b dreaming big, and perhaps thinking in an impractical way of how much they can accomplish, assuming they have the funding. It's a moonshot. It is a moonshot. I think each time it's a moonshot. Uh, Pascal, of course, can talk more about how it works and how all the pieces work together. Um, Singularity will pull together teams of mentors and advisors. They'll walk the companies through so that where they're missing pieces, they might be missing a funding piece, they might be missing a specific technology piece, they might not have put their business model together. Uh, they might need help from a government organization. Uh, they might need help from the FDA. They might have a regulatory issue. Singularity will bring them all in the room with us humble folks from Silicon Valley to kind of be the devil's advocate and the reality check at the same time. Those are the kinds of things where the, uh, the notion of diversity and the experience and understanding that's brought to the table to work with a team is incredibly valuable. And other accelerators work differently, but their goals are pro profoundly different. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to give us a couple examples of what's sure. coming down the road a little bit here, because, I mean, it's a broad mm -hmm. scope of topics, to say the least. I'll let you maybe give us a couple examples. Yeah, sure, just to pick a few. Um, uh, and they go really from the crazy to the uh, unbelievable. So you start out with... <laughs> I like this, crazy to the unbelievable. Okay. <laughs> so you start out with a company called Miraculous. Um, they developed a, a blood-based uh, test to detect cancer um, by simply using a blood sample, looking for RNA, which certain types of cancer shed into your bloodstream. Uh, what they can do is they can detect certain types of cancer pre-stage one, so way mm. earlier than any other test, mm. at a test which costs probably $200 to administer, so inc incredibly cheap. Um, so if they succeed with what they want to do, they change the healthcare system. Um, it goes to a company called Matternet, which uses drones to do point-to-point -point delivery of uh, humanitarian aid in regions where there is no roads. 
um, and ends probably with a company called Made in Space, which uh, created a 3D printer, which works in zero gravity. Uh, they currently have, as a startup, two printers on the International Space Station, literally printing replacement parts up there. So it's this a pretty wild group. This is the moonshot, right? It is truly the moonshot, yes. Or the Mars shot, eventually. The Mars shot. Is that the first planet they're going to try this? Right. Yeah. I mean, the idea is this, right? If, you wanna, if we really want to be serious about being interplanetary species, we need to be able to produce in zero gravity, right? Because you will not fly a spaceship for years and years and take every single replacement part with you you potentially might need. How do you test something for zero gravity functionality? Do you fly a plane up, the, you know, five miles high, and then go into a dive so that there's zero gravity and see if the printer will work? Yes, that's exactly what they did, and they've done about 50 of those uh, parabolic flights. Do you offer any guest passage <laughs> in those flights? <laughs> <laughs> and so have you been on one? I have not been on one. Uh, I heard that it's uh, you need to have a pretty uh, good stomach. Um, like a lot of people apparently uh, oh. go ill there. Maybe you fast 24 hours before, but <laughs> in your role, I am sure that you should qualify to be a spokesperson on Singularity's uh, behalf and speak <laughs> to the experience. Yeah, I agree. So Susan, um, you're involved in and working with some of the companies and moving mm -hmm. them forward. Has any, have any of the companies besides the three that he mentioned made any progress in this direction? Oh. Um, I haven't seen all of them, but mm. I think quite a few of them have actually made considerable progress. I think what's really interesting is when you look at what they're trying to do and then you confront the ordinary corporate reality with it. And so Matternet, uh, Pascal can talk to, has made amazing progress on the funding perspective and on what they've been able to do. It's making that connection that is tricky. And you need open minds to do that. Are you the person that does that on behalf of Singularity or one of the people that does that? Or do you have a team that does that? They have a team that do it. And then with the companies that I work with, I always talk about Singularity. Mm -hmm. And I always bring them to Singularity. But it's nothing like going to Moffett Field on the campus of NASA and visiting Singularity and talking to impassioned entrepreneurs using and building disruptive technologies. So now you're recruiting corporations to participate. Is that a, um, do they participate as a fee-based program or you invite them in to just to sit around and help join a team? So by and at large, we actually uh, see the synergy in bringing startups and corporations together. Mm -hmm. um, largely we're doing it for the startups. So we typically invite corporations, um, as Susan already mentioned, um, to come and support our startups there's a little bit of a translation job we need to do because startups and corporations typically can't, as much as they want to work with each other, they typically don't speak the same language. So we do a bit of like that, you know, translation in between. Um, but we believe it's it's one of the most important things we can do, uh, truly creating this like open the doors to the Fortune 500s because for better or worse, they control a large chunk of the the resources which are available. Plus. They have expertise. They've got you know hundreds of thousands of people working on really interesting things. So bringing those together with startups is is magic. That's great. Well, Pascal, I want to thank you for joining us at, from Singularity University. And Susan, my my pleasure having you here. I'd like to, each of you to uh, give you your contact information for people who'd like to follow up. And of course, I'll let you do that. Right now. Yeah, of course. Uh, so you can reach me at um, Pascal .finet at su.org. su.org, great. And Susan? And you can look me up on LinkedIn, Susan Lucas Conwell. Uh, once again, I want to thank you for being here. I've enjoyed uh, speaking to you, with you, each of you and uh, really understanding this whole project. So I want to congratulate both of you for making a thank contribution you. to the future betterment of the world. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us, yeah, Jim. Yeah, thank us. Thank you so much. This is Jim Conner. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Game Changer Silicon Valley. Each week, we'll address an area of innovation that may emerge as a game changer of tomorrow. You can subscribe directly to the show by clicking on this Game Changers icon or follow us at our website, GameChangers.tv. We look forward to your continued interest and participation in upcoming shows.